Okay, let's jump in to my sermon today. You know, a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Leslie called me because uh, actually uh, in a preaching schedule, I don't get to preach until April due to some preparation that I need to make towards the parenting course. And so when he called me, I was a little bit taken aback, but was prepared, you know, and uh, I said, okay, not an issue. And so I took that time since then to wait upon the Lord, to ask God, you know, out of the blue, I'm not prepared, but since you have given me this assignment, what should I be sharing? And this is where the Holy Spirit guided me to reflect on an incident when I first stepped into Team Challenge, a halfway house a couple of years ago as a chaplain. It was in the early part of 2021, in the midst and the height of COVID-19 pandemic, I follow God's guidance and serve as a chaplain, developing the spiritual program as part of the rehab for drug addicts that's been in place in the halfway house. And when I first entered into Teen Challenge, I attended a series of meetings with various individuals to be familiarized with the running of the center. And during this meeting, I became aware of the various aspects related to the operation of the center. Particularly noteworthy is the fact that the center actually operates 24-7, 365 days a year, and there is no stop, and it keeps on going. In fact, one night, I took upon myself to stay at the centre and observe its operational effectiveness. Particularly, I was very keen and interested in terms of the security aspect. And so in one of the many familiarised meetings, different individuals were sharing ideas, attempting to reach a consensus on how to better work towards a common goal and achieve key performance indicator. Why do we do that? Not because we want to get more bonus or more money in that sense, because annually the halfway house is audited by Singapore Prison Services. And so if we pass, we will keep on running and we will collaborate and that's where a lot of clients will be in place in the halfway house. One of the individuals, an overcomer who became a board member, very successful individual, said this statement that caught my attention, that has been my motivating factor to me, and that is, in all our endeavours, he said this, ensure that they are not only transactional, but also transformational. And it was in that meeting because we were sparring on the fact that is there a possibility for us to open up a youth centre? Not a very good news. In fact, at that time when I was in the meeting, Singapore Prison Services was approaching us due to the fact that many youngsters are getting into drugs. And so that's where we were deliberating, debating, and that's how this board member came up with this idea. And that caption has really caught not only my heart, but my spirit man in the law. And I've been processing it every now and then since in my personal walk with the law. And with that, this is where I want to challenge you today, this morning. While the need of transaction is necessary in our everyday life, we transact, right, every day. Isn't that true? But God is leaning more towards transformation. Let me read that again and trust that this will sing into your spirit man today. While the need of transaction is necessary in everyday life, but God is leaning towards transformation. Now, allow me to elaborate on the difference between transactional and transformational. Now, 
if you look into the dictionary, as you investigate the word transactional, it means an occasion when someone buy or sell something or when money or things is exchanged for something in return, right? So for example, a work, a job, or an internship involve an agreement with your potential employer on the exchange of hours or complete tasks resulting in a designated pay package and or certain kind of perks, right? Now, this is probably something that you and I are probably very familiar with. In modern transactions like shopping, who don't shop? Especially housewife, this last two weeks, you have been shopping frantically, preparing for Chinese New Year, right? Loyalty cards are prevalent this day. They reward you based on the value you spend and the points can be exchanged for free gift. Right? And recently, my wife was so happy in one of the credit cards that she consistently used uh, give her certain exchange of voucher that she can buy you know, and go to the grocery shopping. You know, another common transaction that has been gaining traction is through referrals. So what do I mean by that? By promoting a specific products and encouraging someone else to sign up or make a purchase, you earn rewards, often in a form of a voucher of some values. So in essence, this transaction involves giving or doing something in exchange for a return. Now, what about transformation? Transformation means a complete change in the appearance. Actually, I was trying to find one of my old pictures when I was in my hike of my weight, 100 kg. Can you imagine? I was so bloated up. And I think I did share here to the pulpit when I once went and collect my passport. And uh, when you collect your passport, you have to show your IC, right? And so my passport was the latest picture, but my IC was the old picture. And this lady, when she took my IC, she looked at it, she looked at me, she looked at it, she looked at me, is this you? I said, yeah, it's me, it's my IC. But it's so different because I was so bloated. <laughs> and so transaction means in a change of appearance or character of something or someone, especially so that the thing, the process or person is improved. Now, for example, since COVID-19 pandemic, online shopping has almost become or literally became an integral part of our daily life. Nowadays, by the click of your fingertips, dangerous. You spend lots of money. And in the pre-COVID-19 era, while some businesses attempted to transit to online platform, Many who are sticking to the tradition methods laugh and mock at the idea claiming it would not work. However, those who embrace the online shift have saw, while those who have resisted are slowly but surely losing out indefinitely. Another, another uh, beautiful example is I've never seen Joey, I just named a person in tuxedo, or I have never seen Penny putting on a dress. It speaks about a quite a transformation in outward appearance. In short, transformation means that some form of positive changes take place. Never negative. Transformation is good. In essence, a transaction is a one-time exchange whereas transformation involves a deeper, lasting change that goes beyond the immediate exchange of goods or services. Now, what is the difference in our day-to-day -day routine? Now, transaction focus is on just another regular activity, sometimes a lot of mundane stuff while transformation focus 
on changes for the better. Transaction focus is on reward or punishment. We are probably very familiar with that, especially parents. If you do this, you do your homework, you get some TV time, right? If you don't do this, you don't finish your homework, you don't get that. Simple as that. On the other hand, a transformation focus propels you towards a better living, meaning it encourages you to change for the good effort you have invested in your life. It motivates change, suggesting that it is possible if you care to put in a little bit more effort for the betterment of your life. Transactional is very reactive. Why is it reactive? You give up easily. That's why gym membership love the month of January. After all your feasting in the month of December, they say, come, sign, you need to go to the gym. But once you enter into the first month, you give up because you were busy, you don't have time, you give up easily. Because why? You don't get to see the results that you want most of the time. It involves a very quick exchange. If I can use the term quick fix. But transactional is very proactive. You are dedicated, you are fired up to stay the course because changes will come eventually. In other words, consistency. Little by little, changes will take place slowly but surely. It's just like, you know, you see a lot of youngsters or for instance, maybe you yourself go to the gym. You know, just by a session, you can never see your muscle build up. But if you consistently, little by little, pump the iron, eventually you will see yourself puff up. You know, the Bible illustrated to us both lots of transactional and transformational stories or parables. And this is where I want to draw your attention because God is much interested in your life and mine, specifically in transformation. And there are two parables I felt led by the Lord to share with you. And we're going to see why God is interested in transformation rather than transaction. Let's go, first of all, to the parable of the adultery woman. In John chapter 8, verses 2 to 11, the Bible wrote, Early in the morning, Jesus came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such woman. What do you say? Verse 6, this they said to test him that they may have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to him, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more, he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones, and Jesus was left alone with the woman sitting before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Women, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, 
Neither do I condemn you. Go and from now on, sin no more. Now, the, though the story reads like a modern soap opera with immoral activities, it intrigued my mind as I was reading through the passage in which the affluence or the privilege escape while the less fortunate are punished. Did you read along the passage, remembering how this lady was caught and she was brought to judgment and not the other party? Very interesting. And so, in the passage that we hear, heard, and we have read from the book of John, John exposed the motives of the Pharisees. They were not genuinely concerned about her adultery or protecting the purity of society in their town. What did they want to do? They wanted to trap Jesus to choose between his message of forgiveness, transformational, and obeying the Old Testament law handed down from Moses, which is transactional. So transactional, transaction, where is the problem here? Now, remember earlier I shared with you on transactional, if you do this, you get this, and if you don't do this, you don't get that. And so in this parable, this woman was caught in adultery, no doubt, to the Pharisees in exchange or in transaction for her act according to the law of Moses, it meant she was to be punished. To be exact, she is to be stoned to death according to the law. Additionally, the Pharisees sought to trap Jesus by creating a situation in which he would have to choose between following the Old Testament law given by Moses or promoting his message of transformative forgiveness. You know, this sounds like when I first entered into the ministry, I served a very good pastor, but he was very old, hard man, and he just wanted to stretch us. And I remember the very first time after my internship was over and uh, I was getting married, ready to go honeymoon, I applied leave, brought my leave form to him and said, Wilson, first thing, are you asking me or you're telling me? I said, I was caught off guard. I said, no, I'm not telling you, but I'm asking you. That's why I brought the form for you to sign. And he said this word. He said, okay, before I sign the leave form, I have this statement to tell you. No rest for the evil. The righteous don't need one. I was stunned. And he go on to say, which are you? Wow! <laughs> Finally, I sat there, don't know how to answer. I said, Pastor, I'm neither. Please sign the form, I want to go for my honeymoon. <laughs> but this is exactly what the Pharisees are doing. They are trying to corner Jesus. Now, transformation. So what is Jesus wanting to do? Since the Pharisees had a hidden agenda, or rather an open agenda, and were still an ulterior motives that was so wrong, Jesus sought to redeem the woman so that she would be on the path of transformation. And that is, go and sin no more. You know, the Bible informed us that Jesus began to write with his finger something on the ground. You know, when I was studying the passage, it's very interesting. Some scholars say that while Jesus was bending down and writing something on the ground, he was literally writing the sin of the Pharisees and the scribe. Wow. You know, they were trying to create a drama. As the Pharisees and the crowd sought a response, very reactive because they already knew the law of Moses said, stone the woman to death. Being very reactive because they already knew the law, Jesus, on the other hand, was 
proactive in redeeming the woman who was caught and say this word as they were asking for a response from Jesus. And Jesus just replied, let any one of you who has no sin be the first to throw at her. Now, what can we learn? Please allow me to quote from Romans chapter 2, or chapter 3, verse 23, that we are all very familiar with. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, basically what Paul is urging us, none of us can escape the reality of who we are. Is we are all sinners. You know, the knowledge of right and wrong, even the laws given by God, does not necessarily make us more moral. Agree? I mean, speaking of that, if by knowing the law make us more moral, then Singapore would have been perfect. We don't need to be a fine city. But you and I know we are not. And it is as if we are aware that certain actions are legally wrong, somehow, from time to time, we still engage in them, hoping to avoid getting caught. You know, to be honest, trying to be authentic here, I used to drive. And ever since we have four kids, it's between a car and a children and a helper. And so, after much deliberation, and of course, my wife will always win. And I have to give up the car. And so, when I was driving, one of the things that I don't like is to put on seatbelt. Seriously. <laughs> I don't like. Uh, don't laugh at me. Some of you may be like me. <laughs> and uh, my wife always bugged me. Put on your seatbelt. And I always reply her, when there's no policeman around, I am the policeman. But that's what we are. You know, the Bible says in its original language that we are continuously falling short of God's glory. Why? Because knowing the consequences of our sinfulness is not enough to stop or keep us from sinning. If we are honest to ourselves, including me, we have often fallen short because there are things where we know it is wrong and we still do it anyway. I think Paul sums up nicely for us in Romans chapter 7 and he says it so well. I love this statement. For I do not do the good I want to do. But the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Hello, anybody out there? Right? But I'm grateful. I'm grateful. Why? Because Paul did not just stop there, but he offered a way us out for us. And this is where in Romans chapter 3, verse 24, the scripture tells us, and he wrote, and all are justified freely by His grace, through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. While previously, we did not deserve anything since we earned separation from God because of our own action, sin. This verse described the opportunity for every one of us here this morning. God has made it possible for us to be declared righteous and sinless by His grace, which is receiving a good thing when we actually deserve a bad thing. God gave us a chance for transformation through Jesus Christ to be justified in His eyes as a gift. Which means to say, God is not only interested in your daily transactional lifestyle, which is Necessary. I'm not saying it is not necessary. Which include your praying, 
the reading of God's Word, the fellowshipping with brothers and sisters within the context of the church, or being present like you are seated there right now here in the church this morning. But after doing it, God is wanting us, as written in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, to be transformational, God is asking us to change how we think and to have our minds renew so that we can understand God's will for our life. I thought Ephesians give us a very clear directive as Paul wrote. Okay, chapter Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22 to 24. And this is where the scripture tells us to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Being transformational as a Christian means that we are seeking God daily where improvement will be made within us, allowing Him to lead and guide us in the process. It requires a concerted effort to let God's Word redefine and mold us of who we are. Relying on various spiritual disciplines, we can let God renew our spirit and our mind. So what is the two things that you must do as you leave the church this morning? I want to encourage you, Paul say, put off your old self. But most of us, we always like to look back. Or worse of us, some of us go into self-pity. Oh, poor me. I'm such a lousy guy. But Paul did not just stop there to put off your old self. But he go on to encourage us, put on the new self. Let me sell a little bit of Goya here. Let me do some sales. I want to encourage you parents, come for the parenting class. You know, I grew up as a parent. Nobody teach me. Nobody literally comes, Wilson, let me hold your hand and you'll be okay, you'll be a good father. Nobody do that. And I have to learn through all the difficult lessons and sometimes I wonder, maybe I'm not a good father. And sometimes when I do certain things wrong, I cringe. Why? Because I know it was wrong. And, and one of those moments when I was praying, God reminded me, Wilson, yes, you are bad. I was like, huh? But because of me, you are good. Stop dwelling on your past. Yes, you make mistakes. Who don't make mistakes? But if you allow me to come into your life and you partner with me and with the power of the Holy Spirit, I will teach you. I will give you insight. I will give you wisdom. That's why God has to give me four kids. And today, exactly today, my second one, graduated to be an adult. So two down, two more to go. But this is exactly what we need to do. Put off our old self. Put on our new self. And there was once when I was praying, crying, God, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me as I was praying for my family, my children. God reminded me, your dedication of each of the child to me is not in vain. Whew. God forgive me. I repented of my sin. Because sometimes we are the greatest critic of ourselves. Isn't that true? And so today, may I encourage you in summary of my first point here. 
Transformation implies striving to follow Jesus' instruction. Go and sin no more. However, does this mean that we will never sin again? Absolutely not. If you find yourself having sin, do not allow anyone, including the devil, to condemn you. Seek forgiveness, pick yourself up again, persevere on with God's empowerment. If it's someone else, refrain from condemning like a devil advocate. Instead, may you learn to extend the grace you have received from God and help the other person through God's redemptive plan. You know, when I first came in, Pastor Leslie interviewed me. <laughs> and he said, Wilson, tell me, you know, there's this so many issues in the church with different families. What is your approach? I told him one statement. Pastor Les, I'm for redemptive plan. No one is perfect in this church. No one is perfect in this world. God always wants to redeem us. And I speak that over your life. Whatever you have done past in the wrong, forget about the past. Move forward knowing that God is for you and not against you. So let us together strive to make ourselves and this earth a better place. Amen? Now, let's quickly move on. The parable of Jesus turning the table in the temple. In John chapter 2, verses 13 to 16. And the scripture wrote, The Passover of the Jews was at hand. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and in the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons, and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen, and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their table. And he told those who saw the pigeons, take these things away and do not make my father's house a house of trade. Now, first, you've got to recognize this is a very important time in the Jewish calendar where the Jewish people celebrate the Passover remembering how God delivered them from slavery in Egypt. It is almost like our Chinese New Year. We must have some form of new clothes. You know, recently I, I, we had a group gathering and a, among secondary school friends of 40 years. And I was just asking, curious, hey, you all still buy new clothes? Oh, I don't. Some don't, some do. But just to give you an idea, this is a very important celebration in the Jewish calendar. Now, transaction. What is the problem here? The real fiasco was how out of sync and out of place Jewish worship was with Jesus' intention of making the Father's house a house of prayer. And so Jesus approached a temple buzzing with buying and selling. The temple, the place that was designed all along for everyone and anyone to congregate, for the nation to seek the Lord, was overrun with opportunists trying to turn into a prophet. Their economic transactional drive and the false security in the temple as an emblems of blessing had clouded out space for the nation to draw near. Therefore, Jesus was driving them out. The great sadness of this sin was not so much the role of products and price gotching, which is necessary. You can't go to the temple empty-handed. 
It's almost like today, if you walk into Rocho area, you know, the, the, the famous temple there, you see stalls outside selling different things so that you can buy before you go to the temple. It's almost the same idea. But what is really said to Jesus was that all that was happening left no room for those who genuinely wanted to come to God in worship. They were all being squeezed out by people turning the temple into a marketplace. Today, it seems like we transact almost everything under the sun. Yet, we often neglect mutual encouragement to the worship of God. Now, this is not to say transactions are out of the picture. But what I do want to emphasize is that in our daily activities, you and I must always ensure there is room, there is a space to worship God and allow Him to guide us. At times, I feel so ashamed when God challenges me to do something and I always responded by saying I lack the means or expertise to execute it. I'm almost like the man with two talents. I don't want to qualify myself with the man with five talents. Neither do I want to be a man of one talent who hide the talent and do anything about it. I always call it my, you know, qualify myself as a man of two talents. So two talent means limited talent in that sense. When God called me to do, huh, why me? Pastor Adelina, she's good. She prays a lot. She hears from God. Why me? Or better still, sometimes we are so focused so much on the problem or issues in life that we overcrowded ourselves, leaving no room for God to maneuver. We magnify the problem more than we magnify the Creator, the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. Transformation. What about transformational here? Jesus turned the table simply because he believed in the transformational aspect of the house of worship rather than transactional. The question, if there's any, that Jesus has for us this morning is that do all our gathering and relational investments reflect, even in a small way, the heart and the worship of God in this temple? In all our endeavours, God is constantly leading us towards transformation. Regrettably, we have gone through life and we have gone through church most time, if not all the time, without witnessing absolute change in people's life towards transformation. True transformation manifests in the worship of the one true God allow His presence to guide us into the world, becoming His light to others. That's why this morning, while you enjoy the presence of God, as you lift up your hand and lift up your spirit and your heart to ascribe glory to His name, it's not to stay here. It's so that you receive His presence and as you leave the church later, that you will bring this presence and His light into the world to shine for His glory. It is disheartening to see our churches striving to present their best appearance, elaborate decoration, elegance attire, world-class music, 
all orchestrated to create an impressive spectacular, not Rock of Ages. Huh? Now, please don't get me wrong. I'm a firm believer in pursuing excellence. However, if Jesus were to come, if He were to walk and step into our church during our fiscal service today, He would be seeking hearts filled with His Spirit, always ready to make room for His transformative power. So, we are in the business of transformation and not transaction. And I pray that through our shared experiences in life and church, we will not only satisfy one another's soul, but at the same time, we will spur on and witness absolute transformation in people's lives. Now, to bring it all together, a compelling example of transformation is the metamorphosis of a caterpillar undergo. At birth, a caterpillar has the lie that will transform it into a butterfly, right? A, a butterfly does not put on a butterfly costume or try to act like a butterfly. The caterpillar simply eats, and as he eats, the needed nutrients, it grow. And then when it makes a cocoon, where it remains as little by little, changes take place in the body. Eventually, the caterpillar emerges as a butterfly. The dramatic change of a crawling, worm-like creature into a graceful, beautiful butterfly is the result of an organic process. Transformational. At our spiritual birth, we receive the life of God, which can transform us. Now, like the caterpillar, we need to eat. We need to eat the spiritual food so that we can grow and develop in the Lord's life. And as we grow, we are gradually changed from the inside out. And the Lord wants us to take Him in as our real food and drink. In John chapter 6, verse 35, this is what the Scripture tells us. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall by no means hunger, and he who believes into me shall by no means ever thirst. Now, in the Gospel of John, we see that the Lord is the living bread for every one of us who wants to eat and the living water for all of us who wants to drink. He is the spiritual nourishment we need to take in every day so that we can grow in His life and be transformed. What a beautiful analogy. As I conclude this morning, I want to challenge you as much as myself. Seek for more transformational and not transactional. Don't condemn yourself and clutter your life with too many things. It is almost as if I would encourage you this morning to embrace the question, what would Jesus do? This question became so popular over the time that it even printed on wristband, t-shirts and Bible, all designed to guide you towards considering it in your daily walk and in your daily life. Let me close with a real story of mine. A 
20 plus year ago. I was a youth pastor. I was young. And uh, the assignment was, Wilson, be the youth pastor of our church. They need you. And so, we had about 100 close youth with some young adults that formed the leadership that assisted me. At that time, I mean, I already had four kids. My heads were full. I'm a son to my parents. I'm a son-in-law to my mother-in-law. My father-in-law has seen pass on and gone back home to be with the Lord. It was packed to the brim, to say the least. I mean, if I can describe to you, my life was full. But I have this one particular youth that came from a pretty messed up family where his grandmother took care of him rather than the parents. So he came regularly to the youth service and when I found out the predicament, his predicament, you know, I discussed with my wife and we tried to give and support him in every aspect and impacted him on what is what we term as a wholesome family. Thankfully, he had grown. He has grown to be very attached to us. But as I was uh, progressing in the ministry, I moved out to the adult ministry of the same local church. He has grown to a point where he has and he must decide if he wants to serve our nation, the national service. But he decided against it because he has a British passport because the dead side is from UK. And so he left the shore of Singapore and out the father side of the family in UK for a little while, not for too long. And of course, by then, he totally left the church scene. Then things did not work out. He decided, oh, maybe it's time. And he ended up on the mother's side of the family where, you know, the mother's sister, which is the mother's younger sister, had some form of businesses in Indonesia. And so he decided to go Indonesia. And so he left UK and went to work in Indonesia. And just before COVID break out, he said, enough is enough. Let's move back to where my dad is and finally come back closer to Singapore, went to KL. And that was his dad is. Can you imagine how messed up? You know, after engaging in the ministry for a couple of years, I know ministry and people come and go. And I have the least expectation in people, not because I don't believe in them, but changes come rapidly. I'm only convinced in doing my part and giving my best shot. The rest is up to God to fulfill His will in individual lives. Then came February in the year 2021. All this while, he still left his number with us and, you know, we still keep in touch. Hi and bye, how are you doing through WhatsApp? Out of nowhere, he WhatsApp me again. Thank God, by then he has gone back to church and because it was COVID, it was easier. Everything is online. He shared with me how the Lord ignited his spiritual life again. And all this while, while he was running away from UK to Indonesia and finally in KL, he knew he has a call of God in his life while he attended a few youth camps when I was the youth pastor. He shared with me about his excitement and once if the international borders open, he would love to come back here to visit 
and really want me to assist him in a way, if I can use the word mentor him, on how to fulfill the call of God in his life. Now he owned a restaurant in Bali, preparing himself in due time if the Lord really called him into the ministry at a certain stage of his life, he's ready to surrender it all. In fact, just a couple of months ago, he preached his first sermon recently and before that, he shared and asked for my input. Church, this is transformation. I want to encourage you, don't give up on life and people. Even yourself. God is always leaning towards transformation life in His kingdom and He's still in the business of changing life. Hallelujah. And I know Rock of Ages Church, be sure in everything that you do, work towards transformational and not transactional. And I want to challenge you as you begin to reflect consciously on the idea of transformation in Scripture. Consider your heart and spiritual receptivity. Are you attentive to God's Word, allowing it to transform your life? Or is your heart overcrowded, causing you to resist His work in your life? Why don't you bow your head, close your eyes, let us pray. Father, I thank you. Thank you for allowing me to share your word. And I pray that which have gone on in weakness, that which have gone out in weakness, I know your word that goes forth shall not return void. And I know you are beginning to tug at heart, begin to stir at heart in the area of transformation that you are trying to change us and mold us to be a better individuals. Not just in the church, but respectively in our family and even in our workplace or for the younger ones in our school, in our camps, wherever you are, you have placed us. And I ask that you will continue to bring about a deeper work as we learn to surrender and you our hearts to you. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us all stand, shall we?